Welcome to the 2017 annual meeting of the American Academy of Neurology in Boston. This is the world's largest gathering of neurologists with more than 13,000 attendees who are here to learn the latest scientific research advances in brain disease. My name is Andy Imholt and I'll be moderating today's press conference. We're joined by members of the press in attendance at the annual meeting and by conference call. Today, we welcome Dr. Cynthia Hardin and Dr. Elizabeth Donner, authors of the American Academy of Neurology's Practice Guidelines Summary, Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy, Incidence Rates and Risk Factors, which was co-developed with the American Epilepsy Society and endorsed by the International Child Neurology Association. The research will be published today in the online edition of Neurology, the medical journal of the American Academy of Neurology, and is strictly embargoed until 4 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday, April 24th. Dr. Hardin is currently Director of Clinical Epilepsy Services for the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. She has served most of her career at the Weill Cornell College of Medicine, while she, where she became Professor of Neurology and serves as Chair of the Guideline Development Dissemination and Implementation Subcommittee for the American Academy of Neurology. In 2016, she was elected to the chair of the epilepsy section at the AAN for a two-year term. Dr. Donner is director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and an associate professor in the Faculty of, the Medi uh, Faculty of Medicine at University of Toronto. She is also the chair of the American Epilepsy Society's SUDEP Task Force. As, the as a clinician researcher, she has received peer review funding to examine the risk factors for sudden death in children with epilepsy and the efficacy of dietary therapies for drug-resistant epilepsy in children. She is the co-founder of SUDEP Aware, a volunteer-run nonprofit organization which promotes knowledge and understanding of sudden, unexplained, and unexpected death in epilepsy through education, research, and support. After our lead author's presentation today, we'll take questions first by those in attendance in Boston and then from journalists on the phone. Please remember to identify yourself and your media outlet when asking questions. Just a reminder once again, there is an embargo on this presentation of 4 p.m. Eastern Time today, Monday, April 24th, and a video of this press conference will be posted to YouTube later today. Welcome, Drs. Hardin and Donner. Thank you. Thank you. There is an uncommon risk of death that people with epilepsy and their loved ones may not know about. The risk is called Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy, or SUDEP. The American Academy of Neurology and the American Epilepsy Society have co-developed a new guideline on SUDEP published in Neurology. The guideline is endorsed by the International Child Neurology Association. <coughs> SUDEP is when someone with epilepsy who is otherwise healthy dies suddenly with no known cause. It is important that the rate of occurrence of SUDEP and the specific risk factors for SUDEP are communicated to persons and families affected by epilepsy. Our guideline brings clarity to the discussion, giving health care providers practical information they can use to help people with epilepsy reduce their risk. So for this guideline, <clears throat> Pardon me. For this guideline, our team reviewed um, all the available evidence in the literature regarding um, the topic of SUDEP. And we found that SUDEP is relatively rare in children, affecting one in 4,500 children with epilepsy per year. And that's according to moderate evidence. We also found that SUDEP is uncommon in adults, more common than in children, typically affecting one in 1,000 adults living with epilepsy per year. The guideline uh, demonstrated that a major risk factor for SUDEP is generalized tonic-clonic seizures. A generalized tonic-clonic seizure is a full body uh, convulsive seizure with loss of consciousness, and it's the kind of seizure that most people think about when they think of seizures. Uh, this guideline also found that people with three or more of this type of seizure, a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, per year had a 15 times more likely to die suddenly than people who did not have this seizure type. So uh, that was a very significant finding. 
In total, this translates to up to 18 and 1,000 deaths per year for people with epilepsy with frequent generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Therefore, the guideline recommends that health professionals should tell people with epilepsy that controlling seizures, especially generalized tonic-clonic seizures, may reduce the risk of SUDEP. The guideline shows that being free of seizures, particularly tonic-clonic seizures, is strongly associated with a decreased risk. Educating health professionals and people with epilepsy about SUDEP is an important first step. This guideline makes the conversation much easier with information that may motivate people to take their medications on time, to never skip taking their medications, and to learn and manage their seizure triggers so they can work toward reducing seizures. People who follow their medication schedule or pursue other treatments such as epilepsy surgery may be more likely to become seizure free. For that reason, the guideline recommends that health professionals work with people who continue to have specifically these kind of seizures to try and reduce them with medications or with epilepsy surgery, actively weighing, obviously, the risks and benefits of any new approach to seizure management. The team did look at other potential risk factors for SUDEP, and these were analyzed for the guideline, but the evidence was not strong enough to support recommendations regarding these risk factors in the medical management of people living with epilepsy. So really more research is now needed to identify other preventable risk factors for SUDEP so that we can focus future studies on finding ways to reduce how often SUDEP occurs. Thank you. Thank you, Drs. Harden and Dunner. We'll now take questions from reporters in attendance. Uh, we have a microphone that will be passing around the room. Please identify your media outlet before asking your question. Hello, I'm Susanna Bell from La Portali. But isn't this just, you know, hasn't this general guideline existed forever? You know, take your meds, avoid triggers, try not to have a seizure. So, so what's new now? Yeah, I, I, may I take that question? Of course. Yeah, I think um, you're right. I do present a lot about epilepsy, and I present a lot about frequently about SUDEP, and uh, sometimes people say, well, that's the same old message we knew before. We knew before that uh, we should try to have less seizures and that um, there was a risk to having seizures. But it's very important for it to be clear that the risk of frequent generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and we're not talking about really frequent here, we're talking about um, significant increased risk of death with only three per year, right? So. People need to understand that the risk of generalized tonic-clonic seizures is not related only to uh, maintaining a driver's license, maintaining work, or other outcomes like that. It's actually related to risk of death, and that uh, it's important to reduce frequency of generalized tonic-clonic seizures to reduce risk of death. And further, that uh, I, would, I would hope that this can be a motivator to pursue treatments beyond medication when medication isn't successful at treating seizures. We know that a certain population of people living with epilepsy, medication, which is our best first line approach to treating seizures, doesn't work. And in those cases, we need people to feel safe and motivated to work with their healthcare team to find other treatments like surgery and other approaches to managing seizures. Do you have the stats on paper that you gave just a while ago? Mm -hmm. So in response to your question as well, there is literature about the risks of SUDAP um, with multiple risk factors identified. But using the AAN guideline methodology, we were able to really provide nuance to those risk factors, which ones are well um, established, which ones have strong evidence for their uh, their risk to, to their risk to SUDEP, to impart SUDEP. And um, even though this information is, avail is available, neurologists in general don't uh, take the time or have the ability to really synthesize which ones are truly important for their patients in order to reduce the risk. We found multiple risk factors w for uh, SUDEP that have just low evidence and are not, um, they didn't reach the criteria we could make a recommendation. So I think it's the nuance of this um, process that comes forward and really allows us to help practitioners 
um, guide patients on on uh, reducing the risk of CDEP, keeping in mind some of the risk factors are not modifiable. So right. we were able to identify risk factors that um, the, between physicians and their patients they can actually do something about and reduce the risk. So um, like many medical topics, there's information out there, but it's not synthesized and put forth in a manner that's um, that's actionable, and so that's really the strength of this guideline. We turned the evidence um, into a nuanced set of, um, of which factors are really strongly supported by the evidence as important, and we also um, use that evidence to craft an actionable guideline where we can tell practitioners what can you do to reduce the risk of SUDEP. Hi, I'm Susan Jeffrey from um, Medscape Neurology. I wondered if you could talk about uh, a little bit about your experience imparting that information to patients and how neurologists kind of feel about doing that, and also uh, what kinds of research you'd like to see going forward to maybe fill in some of these other blanks. Well, I'll let you take at least you're involved more in the research yeah. side, so I'll let you take that part, but I'll just speak but to also, the first. But also, I'm a child neurologist, and you're an adult neurologist, so we work in different populations, and yes. I think how we share that information with um, patients, families, caregivers, or people with epilepsy differs a little bit in pediatrics from adult medicine. Go ahead, Cynthia. Well, we can couch it, we discuss it with patients by couching it as the most severe risk of epilepsy. Um, people ask me, you know, are, is having this type of seizure, the generalized tonic-clonic seizure, dangerous? Basically, my answer is truthful. Yes, it's dangerous. You could die from a convulsion, and that's one reason why we have to work together to stop these seizures. I, I think that the way to share information about disease risk is part of um, a comprehensive education around epilepsy. So when someone uh, comes to see their healthcare practitioner, and that could be a physician, it could be a nurse practitioner, it could be a primary care doctor or a specialist, um, when they come to care, they really need to get information about their disease in its entirety, or their disorder in its entirety. And the way we, uh, in my practice, the way I like to talk about the risk of SUDEP is related to all the risks um, of epilepsy and what we know, where we know those risks lie. The other thing, just kind of practically speaking, um, I see parents um, and children, and parents who have witnessed their child have particularly like a convulsive whole body shaking seizure are terrified. Most parents, it has run through the head. They say, I thought my child was gonna die. Is my child gonna die, about, die from this? They've looked it up, they've Googled it. And I think it's almost the elephant in the room. So I think that it is not difficult to bring up risk of death associated with an illness when people are already thinking about it. And in fact, if we as healthcare practitioners don't share high quality information with people, they will find other information through other sources. We're their most trusted source of information and uh, we should be the ones providing it. And the research, how would, sorry, just how you would study going forward this a pretty rare occurrence. Um, SUDEP or talking about SUDEP? Yes. SUDEP. SUDEP in general? Yeah, you were in the guideline to talk about the need for more future research. studies. Yeah. yeah, future studies. Sure. Well, many of the funding agencies, including the NIH, the Cure Foundation, um, for example, have put a lot of money towards um, looking at SUDEP risk factors. Um, but I think one of the most sort of grassroots approaches that we have right now is really the SUDEP registry, just finding out really how, getting more detail on how many people have SUDEP and also getting the, getting the term SUDEP into the lexicon of medical examiners because we're not really sure um, how many we're missing at, at that level. So we're, get, we're providing the best evidence we have on incidence rates, but even just that, that actual number could, sh could and should probably be refined. Um, just through greater awareness and greater um, collaboration with our medical colleagues. Medical examiner colleagues, yeah. There, there's um, actually, as you mentioned, there are some 
really strong research programs ongoing right now. One is called the Center for SUDEP Research, and that is funded by the National Institutes of Health. There's also the North American SUDEP Registry, of which I um, am a part. And uh, through both of those endeavors, there's an effort towards collecting data, not only on people who have died of SUDEP, but on people who are living with epilepsy um, to try and understand understand more about it. Uh, and another approach, um, as with any clinical um, problem, is to look at animal models and really developing a powerful animal model where we can test interventions uh, to help uh, prevent SUDEP, I think, is important as well. All right. Thank you very much. We'll now be, um, let me do the phone here. We will now take any questions from journalists who are joined us via conference phone. All right. There we go. On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology, I'd like to thank Dr. Hardin, Dr. Donner, and the members of the media attending. For more information about the Academy's guideline on SUDEP, please visit aan.com. That's aan.com. From the American Academy of Neurology, I'm Andy Imholt. Thank you.